Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the Africa Policy Journal. My name is Nohale Mwasfaw. I am a mid-career uh, public administration student here at Harvard Kennedy School. I'm also a lead uh, editor for the Africa Policy Journal. Uh, we are here at the Harvard Kennedy School to talk about governance, politics, and communications. Uh, we'll be talking with Mandla Leonel Isaac. Uh, Mandla is a political economist and public policy professional with extensive experience working in policy development, strategy formulation, and analysis in South Africa. And he spent four years working as a public servant between 2014 and 2018. And has, he has over nine years of experience advising different African governments and private sector. He is also a managing editor of ZOOT, a communication and strategy advisor, advisory firm. Before we start the question, Mandla, how do you pronounce your name? So my full name is Mandla Sizwe, um, and then I go by Mandla, but you've said it just fine. Uh, though when I, I did a project in Ethiopia and they called me Mandela, <laughs> so for, for three weeks my name was Mandela, but it's Mandla. Is there any meaning behind it? Uh, so Mandla Sizwe means uh, power of the nation. Um, so Mandla means power or strength, yes. Excellent. We're doing a conversation with a powerful person here. Uh, for today, we want to share challenges, risks, and politics that go behind closed doors of government. Um, we'll start with our first question. So tell us about your childhood and how you end up working for the uh, public service in South Africa? It's a, it's a very interesting question. I mean, um, so I'm actually the son of a freedom fighter. My dad was a uh, student activist and political activist in the Black Consciousness Movement and the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. And so he was in exile in the United States. And so I was actually born in New York, uh, you know, f almost 40 years ago. and. Uh, I was actually reflecting on this because I, I kind of lived through the end of apartheid um, in 1990 after uh, Mandela was released, the same speech where F.W. de Klerk, former president, the late president, uh, after he announced that he was going to release Mandela, he also in that speech announced he was unbanning people like my father who were banned individuals. And so, you know, my dad basically went back to South Africa, I think a month later, and we joined him later that year in 1990. So, I uh, grew up in Johannesburg. My mom's an African-American um, anti-apartheid activist, actually, so that's how they met. And so, but grew up in Johannesburg, so that's home. And so kind of caught the last end of apartheid. I mean, it was kind of dying down, but it was that period of the democratic transition, which was very interesting. I was among the kind of first generation of black students that were taken to formerly whites-only schools, which we called M Model C schools. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was just a really interesting period, you know, learning my, cult, my country, but then also, you know, going through this kind of period that at the time I didn't think about it that way, but looking back, it was kind of one of those unique historical moments where um, I think you've, I've heard a quote somewhere that, you know, there are weeks, when, there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen or something like that. And so... I mean, those years in the early 90s, you know, was kind of the democratic transition and then the establishment of a new country, a new dispensation, democratically elected government, black government, and, and kind of being a part of that generation, which is sometimes called the born freeze in South Africa, in that, you know, we kind of came of age in, fr in the free, uh, free South Africa. And, you know, that's been my, my life. I think. I was super passionate about public service. I guess I got it, inherited from my dad and my parents. Um, just things, politics, justice, um, were just things that I've always been passionate about. And um, so really wanted to get involved in public service. But it took a while, so I did, I went to Howard University, uh, studied politics, political science, but you know, worked in consulting, uh, first in IT and then management consulting. And then after, I think probably about eight, uh, no, 10 to, after about a 10 years of my career, I suppose, um, is when I went into public service. Uh, and that was just an amazing opportunity. Um, we were talking about writing a bit earlier. So 
I had been doing some communications, uh, kind of volunteering on the, one of the political campaigns and was working with uh, one of the politicians in South Africa on writing and communication of uh, the political platform and gave me an opportunity to join in government as a speechwriter and head of research. And so that was how I got into government. It was, it was a really rewarding experience. Thank you, thank you. That was, that was really uh, interesting to hear. Um, you have a history of like, overhauling South African uh, immigration policy. Tell us a bit about that experience. So that was, that was extremely interesting, I guess, thrown in sort of the deep end of policy making. I think about just less than maybe a year into my time in public service was asked to be part of a team to do kind of the first uh, review of South African immigration policy in almost 20 years and uh, to write a green paper that would become a white paper. And, you know, it's, it's a tough policy area, you know, you have social dynamics, economic dynamics, political dynamics, but I guess it was really trying to balance, you know, how does South Africa govern immigration in such a way that, you know, um, creates social cohesion, advances economic growth, inclusive growth. So obviously, uh, immigrants play an important role in bringing new skills and, and perspectives and entrepreneurship. Um, while also responding to the African agenda on free movement of Africans, um, uh, both in the regions within SADC and just broadly throughout the continent. So, you know, that was a unique opportunity and, and got to learn a lot about policy making and, and really apply the skills around problem solving and critical thinking and, and my just kind of humanities background. So it was, it was a really uh, important, I think, development that I was proud to be part of. Um, so, in terms of during that time, you were also responsible for working in the fiscal policy part of the government. Uh, and even in the immigration policy, you mentioned you've touched upon different sectors. Yes. I'm sure that's a very challenging experience. So, in terms of dealing with different factions of the society, can you share some of the challenges for our audience? Sure. Well, gosh, I mean, that South Africa is such a probably unique in many ways and perhaps not unique. Um, developing country, uh, obviously trying to raise living standards for all its citizens, so that's something that's shared by uh, many countries, but you know, having very unique challenges of high unemployment and inequality um, because of just the, the exclusionary and kind of unequal history of our, of our country. And so, you know, when I, I spent a year as, uh, in the Ministry of Finance where we were reshuffled from home affairs to finance, and we're having to work on economic policy, you know, create a budget that could uh, create the conditions for inclusive growth. We had a recession then in 2017 in the middle of the year that we had to try to respond to and think about what kind of economic reforms could we put in place that would, would kickstart inclusive growth. And so I think that was really my kind of crash course in economic policy making and, and probably got me starting to think about coming to the Kennedy School to try to find solutions to these challenges, like how do we develop our country and create the conditions for all South Africans to thrive, uh, probably even at a time when, you know, the kind of industrialization and uh, developmental state strategies that the Asian Tigers used kind of 30 or 40 years ago, uh, some of those opportunities are not quite there for uh, developing countries now, African countries now, because of things like automation and, and just the geopolitics and things of the trade dynamics that have moved on since then. So um, that was kind of a uniquely challenging thing that I think we're still working at. Um, but since probably over the last four or five years, I've started to really kind of develop a sense of how we might uh, advance inclusive development in South Africa and on the continent. Um, you've, you've highlighted the challenges of uh, dealing with uh, economic issues in South Africa and as well as in the broadly in the continent. Uh, it's interesting you've joined the private sector while spending quite a bit of time advising governments and also private people in some of these economic challenges. How do you see the dynamics? So that's actually, it's interesting, there's actually a debate raging back home about, you know, this, what role should the, the state play in, in advancing development versus the private sector and this kind of almost ideological tug of war. Uh, I think, you know, we really have to have a much more nuanced approach. I think, I'm, you know, as you say, it's been really useful for me in my career to have 
been in the private sector, been in the public sector, and kind of got to, got to learn both worlds. Because I think, you know, for successful countries, developing countries, it's about how do you combine the best of what the state can do in terms of setting direction, enabling all of society, uh, creating hardware in terms of infrastructure, but also software in terms of policies and human capital investment and, you know, coordination that can uh, help create, you know, inclusive, drive inclusive development. But then you also need a private sector that can invest, um, that can, you know, you need uh, the conditions for new businesses to start and grow. Ultimately, that's, that's how growth happens is, you know, private sector companies and individuals feeling that the conditions are right for them to start businesses, grow businesses, and in doing so, you know, create employment. So I think it's about figuring out what is the best way to bring those public goods uh, together with, you know, private enterprise to create, you know, developmental possibilities for everyone. Um, so we're going to get to the interesting part. Right. You've been a cabinet uh, speech writer. You have some highlight stories definitely you would like to share. Do you like to share them? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, that's a good question. Some stories. Uh, look, I think it was a, it was a really rewarding experience, right? Um, I got, I mean, I can certainly share a couple of things. I think, first of all, I'll start by saying it was really valuable um, at Home Affairs, which is not a very glamorous department. It deals with, you know, citizenship and immigration. Um, you know, I'd, I'd went from, uh, you know, being at a place like McKinsey where you're working with kind of really privileged individuals with, you know, world-class education and these big companies, some of the biggest companies on the continent and in the country. And then now you're working with trying to help, you know, people get their first identity document to allow them to, you know, have an, have an identity, receive public services, participate in the economy, help mothers get birth certificates, you know, quickly and efficiently. And so I think it gave me an opportunity to see South Africa in a new way. I got to kind of go around the country, whether we were opening new offices or inspecting offices, um, you know, identifying, trying to see the quality of the services we were delivering. So I think that was extremely useful, just being able to see, you know, people that how they rely on government services and when they, whether they are efficient or inefficient really affects people's lives. Um, you know, but I, I would say then there were highlights would, you know, were writing, you know, speeches for parliament, participating in debates, whether it's very political debates around votes of no confidence in the president, where I had to rely on my debating skills to make arguments. Um, and also, uh, you know, there were debates around, you know, policy where I had to find ways to really articulate how we were trying to modernize the department. Um, you know, what our priorities were. And I think, but probably the highlights were doing, uh, writing, you know, a budget speech. So uh, February, in fact, the budget speech is this coming week in South Africa. And, you know, so I think 2018. So yeah, four years ago, I, got, I was the lead writer of that budget speech. I was very new, National Treasury is this, you know, big department with one of the most well-regarded departments in government, very senior individuals who had been there for a long time. And I was coming in there completely new and had the responsibility to, to work with the exco of the department to, to articulate what budget policy was going to be, you know, for, for South Africa as a whole. It's not just for the finance minister. It's, it's delivered on behalf of cabinet. Um, and it's, it's one of the two most watched speeches on the national calendar. And uh, along with one of my colleagues, you know, he decided, we talked about what are ways that we can make the speech memorable. And he, uh, he suggested that we put in a, a, a a line from Kendrick Lamar um, and you know we put that in the speech and it actually you know the delivery was a bit shaky but the minister gave it a shot and you know to this day people will come up to me and be like are you the guy that wrote that speech with Kendrick Lamar and you know I think it was really it was really useful I think in humanizing uh, the minister but more importantly it just helped people it drew people in and it showed me that you know as government, we always need to find, as public servants, we need to find ways to just connect, connect to people, make these kind of complex concepts, uh, you know, very relatable and really, you know, get people excited about and draw them into the business of doing the people's work. Uh, I want to keep you on the communication uh, side of this question. And 
the government has the tools, resources, including you, uh, to communicate to the constituency. How does the constituency const communicate back to the government? Do you have any reflection on that? Not only in South Africa, but generally. No, definitely. I think one thing I learned, and I'm, I think I'm grateful for the experience that I had uh, in, in, as a public servant, because I, I learned that it's very difficult as a public servant to stay connected to you know, the experience that people are having, that ordinary people are having every day. And so you have to make a conscious effort to not just stay in this bubble of, of meetings and functions uh, and your, you know, your government offices where you're, you know, kind of removed from what's happening in society. So it's a constant struggle for, I think, public, the public service to stay, you know, connected as to what's happening on the ground and how, what challenges individuals and organizations are going through and, uh, and what they need and what they're demanding from the state. Um, and then as well to communicate what we're doing. Um, so in other words, to get input, but then also communicate what we're doing so people understand how government is approaching these challenges. So it's a constant uh, interaction. It has to be you know, uh, a day-to-day -day conversation that you try to create and not become just removed, this removed bureaucracy that just hands down rules and regulations that are really divorced from, from uh, people's lives. So it, it takes commitment and it takes citizens to really get involved and try to stay informed about what's happening and to get involved in uh, you know, making their opinion known on, on what their priorities are so that government can be responsive. Um, here in the United States, the constituency has the access to legislators, to leaders. Even the, the Obama administration is famously known for the, for the constituency writing directly to him. Do you see anything of such sort happening in the continent? That's a good question. Um, so you're saying communicating more directly to constituents. So I think that is, I think it's a challenge. Uh, when I listened to, we had the State of the Nation last week, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm looking, listening to the debates, and I think politicians are very, um, you know, comf most comfortable reading a prepared speech, you know, in Parliament or or you know, in the union buildings, which is the seat of our presidency. But actually, you know, the world has moved on. If you look at social media, you know, people, are, you know, people are used to having more direct communication. I mean, people will now, they'll tag you. They'll be like, look, I was at this home affairs office. I waited for four hours. The system went down. And they'll tag the minister and say, this is nonsense. What's going on? So I think and the next generation of public servant, uh, you know, which which I hope to be part of, I think we have to have a much different relationship with citizens where we have more of an ongoing conversation, speak to them directly, and get out of that bubble of you know, reading a prepared speech, but just get on the ground, speak to people, and put ourselves in a position where we have to, to respond. I, I don't think you can now wait for policy pronouncements every few months. Few months. People want to speak to you uh, early and often. And so I think that's something we definitely need to bring into you know, African political culture. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because the continent is 60% is uh, under the age of 25 and digitalization is in a fast pace. Uh, and this sort of communication is one way to think about it. But do you believe the public service is ready or is preparing to adjust to that shift? I think whether or not it's ready, it, we have to make it ready. Um, I, I believe that you know, government has to move at the speed of society, right? So you know, as you know, I mean, as you've just said, said digitalization, digital technology is changing everything. Um, you know, young people nowadays, they're growing up on their phones. You know, w people want, you know, to use technology. They use technology socially, they use technology in their work. And now when they engage with government, they also want to be able to use technology. So I think there's massive opportunities for us to use technology to, you know, simplify government services to make them more efficient, to connect better with the public, with with people, with the citizenry, uh, to to get their views, and you know, in Africa, as you know, I mean, there are so many demands on government, right? There are so many things that the state is required to do, and so we need to harness digital technology as much as possible. To the more cheaper and efficiently we can do things, the more things that we can do uh, for our publics. So 
it's a huge opportunity. Thank you. Uh, you've, you've, your, your experience in the private sector kind of helped you in the, in the public service. Uh, do you see the interaction between the public service and the private sector in terms of coming up with um, radical policies to change the challenges in the continent, in South Africa also? I mean, absolutely. I think um, one, of the, one of the opportunities I think that the most successful developing countries have used, uh, if you look at the Asian Tigers, is really close cooperation between the public sector and the private sector. Um, you know, governments cannot sit and make policy in isolation and then come and, and you know, announce to the, to the private sector, this is what's going to happen. There needs to be, you know, a symbiotic, you know, cooperate, cooperative relationship where, you know, the public sector leaders sit in a room as, you know, heads of eco the economy, economic departments and sit down with private sector companies, big businesses, small businesses, and say, what are the opportunities? How can we be helpful? What policies do we need to put in place that will help you grow sectors, grow your companies, uh, grow your investment? You know, there has to be that cooperation. I think that's just a massive opportunity, and that's the only way we're going to create inclusive growth. We can't have public, the government working in isolation, and similarly, you know, the private sector on its own isn't going to create the kind of inclusive development that we need. We need that really close working relationship. We've talked about some big concepts. We've talked about public service. We've talked about communication. We've talked about youth and the private sector. What's your plan after HKS? So my plan is simple. I want to go home to South Africa as soon as possible uh, and, and get involved in you know, development and pub in influencing public policy. I'm just a big believer that, you know, politics and policy, if you want to address the systemic issues in society, you know, you have to influence politics and public policy. It's very difficult to imagine solutions to employment, to unemployment, to inequality, uh, you know, to safety and security that do not involve, you know, more effective government, more responsive politics, uh, and better public policy that's executed effectively. So. I want to get involved in that in some way, shape, or form. Uh, it could be through policy, working through a think tank. It could be, you know, in the private sector, helping companies uh, interact better with the government. Uh, and hopefully, at some point, it will be involve public service and, and entering political office and being able to shape the direction of, of a developmental state in South Africa. Do you consider running for office? I would love to. I would love to be a part of uh, a new generation of, of, of effective, you know, l public leaders in South Africa. That would be, that would be amazing. That's I think what my life's uh, purpose has been. So I would love to do that. So, what's your advice for people who want to take your path? Gosh, um, that's a tough question. I guess what I would say is, um, you know. Firstly, you know, get involved. That one thing I've learned is, um, you know, leader, leaders are not chosen uh, from all of the capable people in society. They are chosen from the people that put their hand up. And so it's, it's get involved. You know, don't sit at home and, and look at people on TV and say, you know, our political leaders are mediocre or they're corrupt or, you know, they're the people that showed up. So if you think we need better, then, then put yourself forward is number one. I think the second one I would say is to really go out and, you know, educate, educate yourself, take advantage of opportunities. Um, you know, I think we need, as Africans, we need capable leaders. Uh, we need leaders who uh, can, can solve public problems. I always say, we have this debate back home about, you know, is education a requirement for a political leader? I don't think you'll want a doctor who's not gone to medical school. I don't think you'll entrust your, uh, your life savings to an investment manager who has not studied finance. So similarly, we need public leaders who are capable. So I think we have a responsibility, those of us who have the privilege of access to education, to go out and really, uh, you know, stretch ourselves, learn about what's been done, learn about, you know, from our history, uh, you know, pre-colonial African history, post-colonial African history, 
learn governance, law, engineering, learn some kind of skill that you can, uh, that'll contribute to you being an effective public leader. And the third I would say is, you know, it's a long road, so you have to really be resilient. You know, it's, it's tough, you'll be in office, you'll be out of office, you'll be up, you'll be down, you'll be criticized, you'll encounter roadblocks. Uh, you know, Africa is not for, uh, it's not for the delicate, right? It's a tough environment. You know, there will be setbacks, so you really need to cultivate personal resilience and, and have people around you that can support you and that you can support in turn. Um, but it's, it's rewarding, you know, people think of it as, uh, unfortunately in Africa sometimes people think of politics as a lucrative career, it, it often is not. People will be making more money in the private sector and that's fine. So you need to, to really keep your eyes on the prize of, um, of doing the, the public good. And I, but there's, for me, there's just no more rewarding experience than waking up every day and, and, being, and knowing that you're working on behalf of the people um, to make their lives better through the exercise of, of public power and public policy. And so it's, it's worth it. Um, so you've been here for a year. Uh, you've been in for almost eight months now. Uh, what have you learned so far and what are the things that you're planning to take back home? Well, I mean, look, it's been an extraordinary experience. It's been kind of everything I wanted it to be come into the world's leading policy school, um, I really wanted to focus on economic development and you know, being exposed to ideas and, and practice um, that could kind of show me the opportunities for a developing country like South Africa to rapidly develop. And I think I've, I've really been exposed to some excellent thinking in that regard. I mean, the highlight for me has been able to study with uh, Professor Ricardo Hausman um, and people like Danny Roderick and Robert Lawrence, just really amazing development economists, and economists broadly, um, as well as many of the other courses. But in particular, I think I've, I've gained a lot in terms of thinking through economic development today, what South Africa can do. Um, so I hope I'll be able to go back and, you know, I, I trust that I'll be able to go back and really make a positive contribution to our policy debates back home as a result. And then really, I think the other, the other students as well, just my, the other Mason fellows, um, like yourself and everyone else, just learning from each other what, what's going on in our respective countries, um, what people have tried, what's working, what's not working, I think has just really given me, and, and also being able to get beyond Africa and see people from Asia and South America and the Middle East and other developing regions has just really been an you know, extraordinary experience. So. I hope to be able to certainly expect to take all of that and go back home and, and make a contribution. So it's been, it's been a huge exp learning experience. Thank you. Uh, is there any last word you want to share? Um, I guess I would just say that, you know, in South Africa we have this saying, um, well, at least during the struggle, um, that freedom fighters would say, you know, freedom in our lifetime. And you know, I think with Africa, we have these kind of big daunting challenges, and I think we, there's no question that they're big challenges. But I think we need to have a mindset of, you know, inclusive development in our lifetime. I don't see this as, you know, something that must take place 50 years from now. I want to see in, the, in this generation, sort of over the next 10 to 20 years, us, you know, really take responsibility for our challenge, challenges take advantage of opportunities and really drive development in our countries. You know, I think it can be done. And so I think we as leaders need to take that responsibility to say that we will develop the African continent, not 50 years from now, not 40 years from now, but in this generation, in our lifetime, um, that we will create the conditions for all of our people to thrive. So thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for giving us your time and for sharing your story. Uh, it's been a pleasure listening and learning from you. And for our audience, uh, thank you for tuning in. This is the Africa Policy Journal. We hope to uh, see you next time.